welcome um, to everybody attending today. This is the second year for our special construction, um, special funding capability out of four years, and we're excited to have you here to learn more about how to, you can bring fiber to your library. We have, like I said, one, one year of, of uh, participants under our belt, and we have learned some things, and hopefully we'll be able to share those with you today. Um, I think that, Krista, you've already, if you want to just start moving forward with the slide. Uh, do you have anything to add for logistics? OK. So uh, just a welcome today. We have three presenters. Um, and I was driving in this morning to work and thinking about this, and I, I have the least tenure. But I think between the three of us, we have about 50 years of experience working in, in this particular area. Is that true, Tom? Yeah. Are, you, are you 20 years here? <laughs> And I think Chris is um, about there, if not uh, there, and then myself about 10. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so anyway, uh, my, my background is I've been here for about 10 years, and primarily uh, the last five years I've been working with advocacy and working with libraries uh, to improve their uh, internet speed. I use the word internet because, you know, we have a majority of our libraries still are not at what the FCC defines as broadband, which is what 25 up and or down and three up. Or, yeah. yeah. So, um, so we're excited to have these opportunities to talk to you about fiber because it is a great solution. It's um, reliable and completely scalable. And right now, I, I think it'll be about the cheapest you can go to get a run on getting fiber to your library. And so I let uh, Tom, would you like to introduce sure. yourself? Uh, so I'm education IT manager at the office of the chief information officer in Nebraska Information Technology Commission. <laughs> Long title, doesn't fit on a card very well. Uh, but we're a sister commission to the Nebraska Library Commission. And we deal uh, with information technology across all sectors uh, for the entire state. Um, the chair of the commission is Ed Toner. He's also my boss, the state CIO. He's uh, appointed by the governor into that role. Um, since 2006, I've been working with a project you may have heard about called Network Nebraska. It's a statewide network uh, for all schools and colleges, and we have a handful of libraries that are part of that network. We'll be talking more about that later in the presentation. So uh, I think that's it from me at the moment. Thank you. They all know Krista. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm Krista Porter. I'm the Library Development Director here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, I'm one of my duties as since 2009 has been as a state E-rate coordinator for our public libraries in the state. So I do training and consulting and and uh, hand holding whatever you guys need to make sure you can get your E-rate applications submitted successfully and get your um, E-rate funding. All righty, thank you. Um, if we move forward, I, one thing I, I hesitated because there are a number of us on the line and I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about this screen here. I tried to think about putting this PowerPoint together so it would be easy for you to find where you need to go. I hear a lot of people say, you know, it's a three-hour workshop, and I have to find exactly what words or what where I what I'm asking or thinking about. So these little um, highlighted areas are more for you as you go back through the recording. But um, so I've inserted them in here so you can find where you are within um, the recordings and with the PowerPoint to to work together. Just a, a side note on that. But one of the things I found is uh, for our first year. We had seven uh, libraries who participated um, with us, and, and two of them were uh, did not use special construction. But one thing I thought was neat was that they started to talk with each other. I found out, you know, on the phone they'd be calling each other about forms and what they needed to do because they knew about each other and being involved in this um, opportunity. So I thought today we would just go ahead and. Um, and if we slide on down to the next number four, Krista, and then the next one after that, um, do a quick introduction. And I'm asking you to really be brief, maybe in a minute or less, and uh, answer these questions if you can um, very quickly so we know who you are and where you're from and uh, just a couple of questions about 
E-rate and uh, your uh, status with your uh, internet at your library. So do we have any volunteers? Can we get started? Um, yeah, sure. I can, um, I can just start alphabetically. Um, on my list, everybody's alphabetical by first name. So um, I'm going to unmute you and then uh, call you out. And if you have a microphone, that's great. If you don't, um, you can type into the question section. So Anne, Ann Bachman, um, I've unmuted you. You should be able to unmute yourself if you want to talk about what you guys are doing at your library. Is the microphone button. There you go. Can you hear me? Yep, there you are. OK, yeah, I'm Ann Bachman. I'm at House Memorial Library in Pender. Yes, I have applied for E-rate funding every year that I've been here that I know of, which is 21 years. I do believe our current provider provides fiber. I had a sh very short discussion with them about that when I had some issues with getting my E-rate monies back. Mm -hmm. um, what do patrons say about our internet? Well, our local patrons think our internet is faster than theirs at home. But unfortunately, um, I had a visitor from Washington State within the last month, and he actually left me a donation to go toward improving our internet. <laughs> He's also an IT person for a, a hospital out there, and he said, I think you really need to do something about this. So anyway. Huh. Thanks, Lynn. Yep. Interesting. All right. Um, next up, uh, Connie, Connie Manzer. I've unmuted you. You should be able to unmute yourself. There's an um, the microphone button is right underneath the orange arrow but, uh, button on your GoToWebinar interface. Okay. Can there you, you hear go. me? All yep. right. Hi, I'm Connie Manzer, and I'm at Springfield in Springfield Memorial Library in Springfield. And um, I've applied for E-rate funding also every year that I've been library director. That would be 17 years. And um, uh, our current provider does not um, provide fiber to our community but we do we are right next to the elementary school so i believe there is fiber um, outside our library and um, most of the time our internet service is working pretty well if there's not a lot of um, patrons here at the library using our computers but um, when we have a when our all of our computer stations are full, it bogs down. It causes problems with um, our um, with even our um, library system because we our library system is internet based. So that's why we decided we should um, try to um, apply for the fiber. Great, thanks so much. Good idea. Yep. Uh, Julie, Julie Denville. I've got you unmuted. You should be able to unmute yourself. Looks like you have. You should be able to talk. Not hearing anything, though. need to turn something on. So I've got you unmuted, Julie, and you're unmuted on your side, I can tell, but we're not hearing anything. Could she type it in and then we'll come back to her? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, yeah, just give it a second to, um, yeah, if you don't, if you're not able to, if nobody hear you, go ahead and type in, or if anyone wants to pre-type in, you know, what you want to say to answer these questions, if you don't have a microphone, just go ahead and type it in right now, um, and I'll see it and be able to read it off when I get to you on the list here. Let's go on to Christy. Christy Hegstrom, I've, um, there you go. I've unmuted. No, there we go. I've got it right. Okay, yes, Christy, you should be able to talk. You're unmuted on both sides. Oh, she doesn't have a microphone. Got it. Okay. Christy says she's she's Ord Township Library. They do E-Ray. Yes, I can tell you that. Yep. Um, they, she does not know if her current provider does um, fiber or not. Um, and they have not had any complaints about their current internet as far as she knows. But sometimes your patrons are just quiet about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. 
Uh, Laura, Laura Alt, I've got you unmuted. Do you have a microphone? Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. There you are. All right. Uh, I've been the library director for 22 years, and I have done E-Rate every single one of those years. Uh, the school has fiber through their ESU 7 service unit. I do not. Uh, my uh, internet speed is at 50 MPs, and my problem is our smart shield takes forever to go through its process so they can start, and it seems like it's running really slow. So I don't know if that's due to part of the smart shield or uh, what we have going on there. But mm -hmm. it, it seems like when they get on there, it, it's taking them quite a while. Laura, how old are your computers that you're working with, their age? I couldn't hear what she said. Excuse me? No, you're fine. Go ahead, ask again. Oh, how how old are your computers at the? Uh, I've got a win. I've got two Windows tens that are uh, just about two years old, and then I have tablets that I got from the grant last year, last summer. Um, it just seems like they're just they're really slow, and they have to be so patient to get to where they want to go. Okay. Once well, we'll talk afterwards about that. Maybe we can. Just, thank you. All right. All right, Norma, I've got you unmuted. Morning, this is Norma Michaelman. Uh, the library is Nancy Fawcett Memorial in Lodgepole. And we've done E-Rate, I don't know, as long as maybe they've been doing E-Rate. I've been here 37 years, so I don't remember how long it's been. Um, our current provider, we do have fiber in the community but not to the library yet. And I don't have any complaints from our patrons. Our service is pretty slow, but it seems to be okay for them at the moment. Thanks, Norma. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Julie typed in, Julie did what we were trying to get um, earlier, uh, Julie from Bellevue Public Library. Um, they have not applied for E-rate before because they were previously not SIPA compliant. That is required for all of this, yep. Um, not sure if the provider can provide fiber. Um, patrons feel that it's okay, but sometimes bogs down with lots of patrons using programs requiring lots of bandwidth. Sounds very familiar, yes. <laughs> uh, all right, where are we at here? Peggy. Wait. There we go. All right, Peggy, you should be able to talk. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, Peggy Lighting from the Lead Randolph Public Library up in Northeast Nebraska. Um, we applied for E-rate funding for about five years. I think the last time was in 2017. That's about the time I think they quit doing phone. So, mm -hmm. we, um, so we quit about that time. Um, I do believe that we have fiber close. I think we do have it across the street because our school is across the street. So I think that's hopefully a good thing. Um, our internet service is, it is, it is good. Um, kind of the same thing when there's a lot of people on, we can, we feel like get bogged down. But right now, um, you know, it's still, we're still like a little past COVID where we don't have as many on the computers at the same time as we used to. So mm -hmm. I haven't not I haven't noticed it as much, but I'm sure it's still there. I just um, we just don't have our room full like we used to with mm -hmm. that. But. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Peggy. Yep. Um, Randy, you're up next. I've just unmuted you. You should be able to talk. Randy at Beaver Crossing. I can hear you making noise there, Randy. You can go ahead and talk. Oh, I didn't have my hand up. Oh, well, we're just going through everybody to have you all just to, um, introduce yourselves. <laughs> Do I, I have a microphone, huh? I, I also have a new computer, and I wasn't quite sure what it would do. Um, <laughs> okay, you're good. We, we haven't applied for E-rate 
uh, for more than 15 years ago, since more than 15 years ago. Uh, it just didn't seem to provide any, any benefit for a library as small as we are. Okay, and um, do you know if there's fiber in your community or how uh, is it? There would the be fiber in our community. Uh, there's a uh, telephone switch about two blocks from the library. Hmm. And I imagine they've got fiber there. Okay. How are your patrons doing with the internet service? Do they uh, mention anything about how the speed is? We, we just have very, very low usage. And, uh -huh. and it's mostly because it's so slow. Uh, it, it's actually pretty good most of the time, uh, but when the kids get out of school, they all log on at once and uh, and saturate the uh, the whole network that we're uh, part of. And uh, I mean, it pretty much grinds to a halt. Yep. I'm sure lots of other libraries can feel the same way. All right, thank you, Randy. Uh, Stephanie, you are up next. I've unmuted you. Wait. I know I'm on twice. I'm trying to get my laptop fixed. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. I can. <laughs> I've got audio on my phone and then I've got video on my computer. I'm a mess. That works. We have the options. <laughs> um, except it's no longer showing me the question. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, I'm from CB Preston Memorial over in Orleans. Uh, we've been doing E-rate longer than I've been here. I've been director for three years. Um, no, we do not have any fiber in our community. The villages um, to either side of us have fiber, but they have not made it to ours yet. Hmm. And then the internet, for the most part, ours does pretty well. Sometimes our computers clog down because they put Roblox on our computers. <laughs> Hate Roblox. Um, but other than the computer issues, our, our internet goes pretty good. <clears throat> okay, great. Thank you, Stephanie. And Tanya at Ashland, we've got you unmuted. All right. Um, I am at Ashland Public Library, and I am a new director, and so I have never done E-Rate. And as for our library, we haven't done E-Rate here since at least 2016 or 17. Um, our community have fiber, uh, our school has fiber, and then, um, like, at home I have fiber, so it's just getting into the library, and then, for the most part, our internet does okay, um, however, we haven't had the after school rush yet, and mm -hmm. I, I'm waiting for that, because there's been days where we can tell just on our computers that it slows down, um, just trying to load pages and things like that. And so I am sure that the 3.30 to 4.30 um, rush of children, now that we are out of COVID restrictions, will pretty much bog down the internet. Something to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Tanya. Um, and while we were talking, Mary from Nelson logged in. Mary, I've unmuted you. Um, you should be able to unmute yourself and tell us about what's going on with you at your library. If you don't have a microphone, you can type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface and um, tell us about it in there. Yep, you can. You have to unmute yourself, Mary. There's a microphone button right underneath the orange arrow button on your GoToWebinar interface that will unmute you. There you go. You are unmuted, but I can't hear anything. I want you to just go ahead and type into the question section then if we're, if the microphone's not working. Um, and that is everyone who's here. The only other person that is uh, with us this morning is uh, Cindy Osborne, who is our Western Library System Library Director. Um, keeping an eye, you know, making sure she's uh, up to speed on what's going on here to help out any of the libraries that may be doing this today. And um, we could just move forward. Yep, that is everybody. Um, so from Mary, do you want to try and type in or? I'm going to remute Mary for now. Yeah, if she gets her information typed in, I will jump over and read it. But that is everybody who's here this morning. Yeah. Great. Good crowd.
So we'll just move forward. Mm -hmm. Next, next slide. So I think that what I what one of the things I determined um, in and I think we have those of us working with last year's group is there's a lot of uh, for some and fortunately for those of you who are, are familiar with E-rate, um, you're you'll be familiar with this timeline and some of the information that's included in it. But for many people, it is a, a challenge because of all the acronyms and where all the money is coming from and and uh, it becomes a challenge to work through. So we put this infographic together and we're going to send this to you um, along with the PowerPoint and a couple of other documents um, after today, today's session. But we just wanted to start off by uh, identifying that you do have options for how you get your fiber to the library. And in particular, um, Tom, as he stated before, has been engaged with Network Nebraska for um, a number of years. And I think I'll let him talk through the top part sure. and then I'll go through the bottom or we'll work together as we talk about it. Um, so uh, I'll let you talk about the timeline as far as, well, I guess what I should say timeline wise, those of who aren't uh, uh, familiar with E-rate, it runs from July 1 to June 30. And so it's like the federal fiscal year, I'm sure is what that is. And so all of these events are queued up from the beginning where in um, uh, July 1, you can already submit what they call a Form 470 and get bids for various things that are available with any rate. But um, you cannot turn on and, um, and or have your um, speed change or anything with your internet until the following July 1. So this is all a process that goes on. So cue in on what uh, Tom is talking about because this of course is um, the NITC's Network Nebraska and their folks who are moving through and making um, making uh, the situations for you to get fiber the following year. Whereas when we speak below, we're talking about you uh, being engaged in all of these activities. Very good, thanks, Holly. And thank you all for your introductions. Um, impressive uh, group on the webinar this morning. I appreciate it entirely. I really like hearing your stories um, from the local level about the quality of your internet. So, as Holly mentioned, Network Nebraska is the statewide network for schools, uh, colleges, but also local government. So, the legislature gave us a mission in 2006 that we should meet the demands of all public entities in the state uh, for telecommunication services. So we proceeded on that mission. We do whatever the legislature tells us, uh, but it was also a passion of mine and everyone with whom we work in this space uh, to get the most advanced telecommunications in the state to all of our uh, community anchor institutions and schools uh, districts were all completely on the network by uh, 2015 so it took us about nine years as you have already recognized they were all fiber uh, to literally every building in the state so that's over a thousand school buildings 244 school districts uh, 17 ESUs and then all of our colleges. So currently we have three, uh, soon to be four libraries on Network Nebraska. They're Omaha, Lincoln, Grand Island, and then through a consortium in the Southeast at Beatrice Public Library is joining as of July 1. And they also got fiber uh, special construction uh, just started. So their, their connection is brand new and much, much faster than they have. So as Holly mentioned, this calendar of E-rate, whether you're involved in the program or not, we always say that we're our feeder in three years of the program. So right now at our office, we're uh, closing out accounts that ended on June 30, making sure those finances are all correct. 
We have new or updated services that just started on July 1, and now we're planning an RFP for July 1, 2022. So it forces us to be mindful of the deadlines that the FCC has placed upon us and make sure that we administer the program properly. So right now we are collecting in our office uh, addresses by request for anybody that wants to be included in the state RFP that will be coming out in late August or hopefully early September. We bid for circuits for any requested entity at no charge. It's part of the state's service. And then when bids are, they come back, we award the contract to the most uh, qualified vendor at the lowest cost and then set up a state contract. It's kind of like a buffet line where you as a library can choose to purchase from those services that have been state contracted or you may find that your local procurement guided by the library commission will be more advantageous. So we really don't know those results until all the bid costs come back. And Holly uses this famous expression, we're going fishing, which means uh, these are ones that you may throw back, but it may be fish that you catch and keep. And we won't know that until um, either or both of the procurements have run their course uh, before holiday. So before in the November, December time range, bids are back, they've been evaluated, we're ready to award an agreement or contract. At the state level, we go into contract regardless of your decision, and it just sits there in, if you want to leverage that. At the local level, you'll do a, what's called a Form 470, coupled with an RFP, and you'll get local attention back from providers uh, bidding on your internet service. Maybe one, maybe more. If there's more than one, you have to go through the evaluation process. And if uh, the bids are satisfactory and the service is what you want for you, your board, in your village or city, uh, then you go ahead and sign an agreement. And then the rest of the rate program follows. So you will encumber funds in January, February timeframe. You'll commit to an order to that company. And then if everything goes as planned, your new service would start July 1, 2022, and it'll be the fastest service you will have ever seen. And um, I don't want to scare you, but if kids find out about that <laughs> and other rural patrons, uh, you may be looking to build an addition because you could really be the most popular place in your community uh, to offer internet. Um, a quick backdrop for all of this, the reason this funding has been made available by the Library Commission was a study by the Rural Broadband Task Force and advocacy by the Library Commission to the Governor's Task Force that said libraries are literally not where they need to be in terms of services and bandwidth. The story from the individual that traveled here from Washington State or Oregon, possibly California, they don't ask the library, they just give them 1,000 megabits or 500 megabits of service, and it's heavily state funded. In Nebraska, we're a local control state. The program has been made available, but the library has to decide that it's appropriate for them. So that's the process we're about to enter. That's the reason for the webinar, and we'll pro be providing uh, quite a bit more background. But that's an overview of the Network Nebraska timeframe. It looks very similar to what you'll be doing at the bottom of the slide will be your local procurement. It's just that you'll have more uh, independent in decisions. Yeah, yep, uh -huh. exactly. More control over that. Um, so I, I like Tom to start, and that's why he's on the top, because he does a really good job of <laughs> explaining it all, because he has at least another decade of, of uh, knowledge about this, if not more. But what, a couple of things, if you'll, if you'll look here, you'll see that um, the contract that you put, to, that is put together uh, with the Network Nebraska is a four-year contract. Um, we last year opted, all of the libraries that we worked with opted for a three-year contract um, with the um, uh, provider. 
for, for fiber. So there's a, a slight difference there. And if you're looking through here, there are some deadline guidelines, we're going to call them, because um, one of the things that you need to do is, you know, you have to finish certain things before you move on. Um, in particular, uh, for you, if you were to submit the uh, bidding process of a 470 form for fiber uh, first, then you're, you need to make a decision based on what is returned to you. We have had every library received at least, at least one bid, which was great because we were sweating it a little bit. We weren't sure if it would be the case or not. And I think now that uh, there's much more funding going into um, uh, the issue of broadband in rural areas, uh, the carriers are much more keener on, on looking to see you know, what they can do, that we may even see more bids this time. But there was one library that had three bids. Um, and the rest were one or two bids out of the actual, there were five libraries who did the special construction out of the seven um, that actually went for fiber that we're aware of for this year and at least touched base with the program. So anyway, after you receive your 470 uh, bids back and you make an evaluation, and this we'll talk about further uh, along in training here in the next uh, tomorrow, but um, you will want to then submit for the universal services funds that are available from the Nebraska Public Service Commission. And this was something that they uh, made available for schools and libraries. So they will match, those of you who know your E-rate discount, they will match up to 10% of that and through application for this grant with funding. And then from there, because we have now this state match, the federal government is saying, the FCC, it says, okay, so you've matched it, we'll match it too. And just my experience working with libraries for the last you know, five, six years and talking about uh, could they afford to pay for fiber to their library, I think that for most rural libraries, that up to 20% is absolutely critical for you to have success and bringing forward the idea of bringing fiber to the library within your your town board city administration. Um, we had two libraries out of the five this uh, round who actually had 100% of their fiber, what can be covered, what is eligible to be covered, covered um, through submitting and working with the special construction grant. So hopefully that uh, tweaks your ears and you're, and you're thinking a little bit about that. And Holly, you can talk a little bit about what the current discount would be. So 80 becomes 100. Right, yeah. 70 becomes 90 where they pay 10. Uh, yeah, I was going to say anybody who's got an 80% discount as their basic E-rate discount would get this done for free because the state does 10% and the E-rate matches that 10% and covers the extra 20 that normally the library would be responsible for. Right, and again, for many libraries, they have that covered. Okay, I think we're ready to move on. I, well, I, I'm not sure. I guess we'll we'll save the questions, and maybe you can write them down. We'll save our questions toward to, toward the end to see how things are going um, as far as our time. Um, Krista, this is your area. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. So um, when before even thinking about getting into doing this, there's some things you do need to think about, and um, working with your local government is definitely something you have to check in on. Um, this is you know, those of you that know um, where the fiber is in your community. You know now we need to get it from wherever it's ending to the library. So this could be a major construction project potentially. Um, it could be digging trenches, running lines, whatever it might entail um, coming from the school that's next door over to your building. So you'll definitely need to talk to your mayor, uh, your city manager, um, whoever would be in charge of that kind of thing <clears throat> to make sure they know that you're interested in doing this, that they are on board with whatever might um, be going on. Um, your own municipality may have rules regulations, statutes, things that about how you need to apply for a large project like this. Um, do, do, you know, we have, we're going to give you examples of RFPs. Sorry, did you guys want to say something? No? Oh, oh. Um, yeah, we'll discuss that topic tomorrow, that, or I mean on Thursday, that will be our 
Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. So um, if you do need your request for a proposal, you heard me, we're going to give examples, things that Holly has put together um, to show you what, you know, we know needs to be in them, but your community may have something that, uh, how you're supposed to do these kind of large projects. Some of these projects could potentially cost fifteen, twenty thousand dollars or more. Some are cheaper, we found out, but there could be some that are going to be a pretty big chunk of money. Um, and then, who do you need to talk to? Do you need approval from someone for doing something like this? Um, your city administrator or manager or mayor, um, like I said, uh, they may need to be. You know, approving this kind of project. Uh, if you're going to be connecting or doing something with the city IT, talk to someone there. They will know what um, the city has and what you need. Um, you will be signing contracts with these companies for some major construction. So your attorney, city clerk, and accountants are going to dealing going to be dealing with the money aspect of it. Um, and of course, you're going to want to talk to your library board. <laughs> Make sure they know and are on top of and understand what's coming and what's happening um, with this. And there may be others in the community. I'm not sure if anyone knows if uh, this is just people that we know that some of our libraries have dealt with as they've been going through this process. So we'll move on to the next slide. So this is where we had the infographic earlier, and um, this is what we're basically talking about. Uh, Tom and I will be addressing. Uh, network, the differences for bidding process, et cetera, for Network Nebraska versus uh, a local um, procurement for fiber. So at the bottom of this slide, let's go back to this just, just a moment. Um, we don't want to dwell on this too heavily, but in the E-rate program and in the, in the world of telecommunications, there are actually two different services. And what most libraries have, and almost all residences, is what we call ISP Internet, Internet Service Provider. They bring the internet to the home, and it comes with the pipe, whether it's copper or fiber, to get it to your locate, location. Same with libraries. So we never have thought about that any differently. Right below that is what we call fiber Ethernet. Ethernet is the actual transport of, of the telecommunications separated from the internet. So the way that I use as an analogy, ethernet or fiber is the pipe, like a water hose, and the internet is the water that runs through the hose. So why would we ever think about bringing a water main into our house and not have water run through it? That's exactly the kind of the framework and that's why libraries are all connected that way school districts on the other hand we did their transport completely separate from the internet and then we bought by the internet for the entire state in only a few purchases and by doing that we turn it into a commodity and we force the price down through competition when you do internet plus transport you may only get one provider in your community and I hate to say it, but sometimes they're at liberty to charge you whatever they want. So when we separate those two and bid fiber Ethernet separately, you may get a company that comes in that only does transport, doesn't worry about the Internet side of things, and that can actually affect the affordability of your project. That makes sense? So you can go ahead. <laughs> So we're looking at what are my options for, for bidding, and then we've added in here this NUSF-117 fiber, and this is basically we call the, uh, the component of the Nebraska Public Service Commission uh, NUSF funds, NUSF-117, just for jargon purposes, um, probably should change that. But anyway, so you're, you're thinking about, and, and I guess what I'd like to just say here too is, these are, you, you don't pick one or the other. Um, you know, I would encourage every library with their uh, community's consent to go ahead and uh, send Tom and his email will be at the end of this presentation, a, um, an email with your, your name, your library's uh, name and address and request 
that you be included in this next uh, cycle of uh, 470 forms for from Network Nebraska. But you locally, let's say, you know, you decide to, which I, I will also encourage, is that you go ahead and file a form 470. Those of you who aren't part of E-rate basically yet um, may not know this, but this is basically the you're, you're filing and letting um, those interested know that you would like to have a bid for fiber. And things that must be included in this are the construction of the network facility. So this would be the nuts and bolts, you know, the actual uh, hardware and, and everything like that, that you'll need to indicate in an RFP or ask the bidder who returns will know that they need to let you know about that. They need to know about design and engineering. How how is this uh, uh, fiber going to be laid? Um, will it be in the air? Will it be in the ground? Um, what you know? What are the costs involved? True costs involved in that um, will have to be identified. And then the project management will be uh, the company that um, obviously is is bidding for the fiber. So uh, this information primarily is in the RFP, which don't get nervous. Um, if, if it's possible, I always have told every library to take the RFP that we put together here at the Library Commission to your local administrator and have them review it first. But all the libraries from last year used this as their method of uh, communicating out there that they were interested in getting a bid for fiber in their community. And I visited with also those providers who responded and I'd say in general, they were all pretty happy with it and felt it was adequate, which is a, a sigh of relief uh, for um, us because I don't know if you all would, once you see it, this um, RFP, and then of course the state's RFP is even more complex, that uh, that might be something that would make you hightail and run, but please don't because um, I really think that we have an adequate solution for that. And we'll be talking more about that tomorrow and we'll be looking at that. Um, and so what happens is that you, you file your form 470 and you have it out um, on circuit there for uh, state federal law, I think it's 28 days uh, for uh, opportunities for responses. And then when those responses come back, you as a library, as the director, will put together a small team. Um, this, what I would recommend is three uh, to review the bids that come back and make a decision as to which one um, you are going to accept. Good, good, thanks, Holly. And how are these two different columns uh, different from each other? Um, at the local level, when you do your Form 470 and point providers to an RFP, you have a single site, your own site, your own address that's seeking service. On the state level, the RFP for this fall is already shaping up to have over 50 circuits on it, schools, possibly libraries, and other requests. So uh, it's a highly sought after process with the state because providers know there's a lot of business there that they want to compete for. And so our goal with all of the competitive procurements is to drive more competition into communities where there may not have been any previously. And you would say, well, we all know who our telephone company is or a cable company. That's the only one we've ever known. Well, it turns out when you have incentives that are fiber is paid for to be in the ground, you can actually get new companies to come to uh, your area to compete just for your circuit. And that's our job to do at the state. So we do a single form 470. It points to an RFP that's over 40 pages long. It's a cost proposal. It has the same main elements that your local RFP will have, those three sub bullets. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we'll evaluate all these bids for you in a formula and then make awards and contracts with fiber Ethernet providers, whether you opt to buy from them or not. So the state's process is no obligation and no cost. We just do it for you because your uh, political subdivision, we're thrilled to uh, perform that service. Next slide. So what kinds of costs will my library incur? Well, um, one thing, as Tom alluded to earlier, that 
sometimes some providers may have more um, cost um, effective or, or more uh, uh, lower cost for some of these items. And again, it's because you're looking at uh, bidding in an area that you may only have one provider, uh, we don't know the overall cost, what it will be, except for the fact that you have a significant discount available to you with the special construction. But the types of costs that you are going to have to incur include the uh, the non-recurring costs um, with the normal E-rate discount, which we were uh, talking about before, could be average 70, 80, 60, plus 20 percent. So the non-recurring costs uh, would be, um, let's see, the fiber bill costs with normal E-rate discount. Okay, so that, that pricing would be uh, whatever the discount after the discount is, is uh, enabled. Then the monthly recurring costs uh, of at least uh, 100 megabits per second service. That um, is a, something I didn't mention earlier. Basically, the NUSF funding, if you were to um, want to secure that, you have to have a, a, a minimum speed uh, that you uh, contract for of 100 megabits. So what we found last uh, year was we had some a number of libraries did 100, a couple did one did 200, and the uh, library director who's going to be speaking to you later today, um, toward the end of our workshop, is she uh, went with a basically a half a gig, so 500 megabits. She her attitude was, my gosh, this is great, pricing is great, I'm just going to go for it. So so that um, possibility is there, but you must at least have a minimum. And this would be your cost uh, for your internet service on a monthly basis. And then there are additional taxes and fees and surcharges that could be possible. Uh, we would work with the bid to try to figure out what we might be able to incorporate into your special construction costs, but um, there, there may be some other charges there. In general, I didn't feel like any of them were uh, something that a library could, could manage. And I'll just jump in here. Also, mentioned those monthly recurring costs. It doesn't mention it on here. Those would be um, eligible for your. You would apply for an E-rate discount on those as well. So you would not be responsible for special construction, right? The form for right. that. So yeah. you would be responsible for the full cost of the monthly, just what was above your um, E-rate discount. That extra twenty percent is only for the special construction that happens. Then the monthly, you know, if your if your discount is eighty percent, you just have to pay for twenty percent of the monthly costs. Thanks, Chris. And the only, only one other thing that I wanted to mention is, in that case too, you may have more than just a uh, yearly um, contract um, because if you if you're contracting with the fiber, um, they have different pricing depending on how many years you're actually uh, signed up for the monthly recurring cost too. So it's advantageous generally to have more than a, a one or two year contract because the pricing goes down. Very good. On the right side of the slide is the Network Nebraska model. So non-recurring fiber bill costs are the same. Uh, there would be a quote in the bid response for monthly recurring costs. The reason I put in there, no surprises and friends, um, the state requires bidders to identify all costs that would show up on an invoice mm -hmm. on July 1, 2022. And if it's not in their bid response, it's not allowable. And we will mm -hmm. take them to the woodshed <laughs> with that one. And we have numerous times because that's what's in the RFP and the, the master agreement. Now, where we differ from a local ISP that only charges you a single monthly fee may or may not be coupled with your phone service. By the legislative uh, bill, we have to charge to keep the consortium together. So right now we have 293 entities in Network Nebraska, and they all pay a collection of monthly fees to keep the consortium alive, support, and all the services that come with. So right now, any library that we connect at 100 megabits for your main service through the state contract would receive the lower of those two fees under participation. It'd be $62 a month. It's an administrative fee. 
you pay for a portion of the bathroom called in a regional transport. Right now, I think that's three dollars and twenty-five cents. So between those two fees, it'd be sixty-five dollars plus the cost of the circuit, and then a nominal fee for internet after e-rate, and we file e-rate on that on a statewide level. So it'd be eleven cents per megabit per month. So if you were a fifty meg internet customer writing over a hundred meg pipe. 50 megabits times 11 cents would be five dollars and fifty cents. So total combined be somewhere in the seventy dollar range plus the cost of the circuit and the services that come with. And then that's what you would want to weigh against your local response you get from an ISP. And our feelings are not hurt if you go with a local internet service provider. The objective is to get you the fastest most reliable, most affordable service. In some cases, if that would be Network Nebraska. In other cases, it might be the internet service provider directly. No problem, as long as we go through that process. And that's why Holly suggested that you may uh, allow your address to be responded to with both the state and your local RFP. Mm -hmm. So we'll move to the next slide and we'll let you keep going. <laughs> we'll, we'll shake them up. <laughs> so this is really not a good place for me to be because it says what are the pros and cons of either option and I'm a biased individual. <laughs> Being involved in this project Network Nebraska for so long and what it's done for Nebraska education and the libraries that have committed has been phenomenal and we'll take the case of Grand Island uh, Public Library and they've been on our network since Oh boy, it's like 2009 or 10. So they've been through the bid process uh, three times. And the cost that they were paying previously to our um, procurement process were dramatically different. So many of you know or remember Steve Fossilman. He was able to triple the bandwidth speed to the library and still cut costs. And every time we re-procured that circuit, Costs have gone down and bandwidth has gone up. So now he's, uh, Celine is the new library director. It is entirely possible that in that case, uh, we can bring on the city offices of Grand Island through the library circuit onto Network Nebraska, and everybody would enjoy faster speed. So those are the kinds of things that can happen at the local level when you're in a fiber community but it's not coming to the library, or you may be in a non-fiber village and only the remote school has the fastest bandwidth. We want the same for your library. So if you pick through these bullets, um, there's pros and cons to both. We don't want there to be any surprises for you, your library board, or city or village council. They, they need to be apprised of the situation going into this and what's going to come out. But we anticipate that there would be a decision making time uh, before Thanksgiving, let's say, where you get to look at both bid responses and make a decision yes, and we're going this way, or maybe no, it's not in the cards at this moment for our municipality. And you'd want to delay a decision until maybe 2023. So, those are some of the pros and cons. Uh, Network Nebraska has a whole slate of other services that local ISPs do not provide. We have the lowest cost in the country for Zoom Pro licensing. And right now, the three libraries, soon to be four, they actually pool all their Zoom licenses together and then share costs so they can have their own account. And we would be able to keep adding more libraries to that. And it improves your uh, collaboration uh, with that service across the state with the low cost licensing. So, um, because of what the legislature requires us to do, we tell you from the outset Network Nebraska may be more expensive monthly, but it may be that the other services that come with the management of the network and someone watching your circuit 24 hours a day at the university 
may offset uh, the lower cost you might get with an ISP directly. And the last thing I would say, because of our 24-7 operations center, if your circuit would go down, like in the middle of the night for some reason, we have an operator there that would detect the circuit outage, create a ticket, and hopefully get trucks rolling before you open the library the next day. If you're with an ISP, uh, you're going to come in, open the door, log on the computers, and wonder why there's no internet. So that's one of the differences between the two services. Thank you. Um, I I wish we could all be on network Nebraska. <laughs> So, I'm <laughs> Tom, Tom is a Tom really is a, a, an excellent uh, evangelist for uh, Network Nebraska, and truthfully, uh, there are some things there. In fact, the one he just touched on just now, I think about a lot because I've called up the library and they've been like, you know, we haven't we haven't had the internet for two or three days, and that to me um, is worth some some amount of money, and of course that that. Is how I feel about it. That may not be how you or your local administrators feel about it, but just to, to make a comment overall. But I do, again, encourage you, please send him your address and um, the okay for having the, them bid, the network request of bid on your library. It'll be interesting to see what they come back with. Um, so overall, because we, uh, when you do your local ISP internet access um, procurement, you are not um, going to be getting some of these uh, features that, that Tom just described. The cost could, could be lower. So that's one reason that you, we would consider that as the, the, a pro. Um, we could talk a little bit about e-rate filing. Uh, currently, we file um, e-rate for the Omaha and Grand Island Library as part of their normal fee. So you don't have to go out and get a consultant. Uh, it's just filled into the cost. Um, we're actually paying the monthly bill on those circuits, uh, filing for E-rate, and then charging the net cost back to the library, just like a provider would be on the left side with your ISP, um, applying discounts to your bill, and then charging you only the net. So we do the same thing through our accounting department, and, uh, and then go ahead and file the annual uh, forms for your circuit. Uh, on time and file e-rating and, and apply the discounts. Um, there's, if you're steeped in the program, you may know the third bullet on the right side. And this is somewhat of a loophole. Um, when we file our RFP and we're seeking Ethernet transport only, and that's the service that e-rate is applied, Technically, you do not have to have content filtering on that application. But if you get internet uh, through either Network Nebraska or local ISP, uh, that situation is moot, meaning you do have to demonstrate SIPA compliance. It turns out on Network Nebraska, we have two internet rates. We have one for schools and libraries, a file E-rate, it's 11 cents a May. And then we have a rate for colleges and municipalities where E-rate doesn't apply, and it's 27 cents a May. So in those cases, 16 cents margin would be if you're in a community where your board is diametrically opposed to filtering for First Amendment reasons, you could actually play the Network Nebraska game with only a marginally increased cost per month on just the water or the internet that flows through the pipes. So that was a little bit involved. Um, Krista, I need a, a reality check. Was that explained properly? Um, yes, that sounds, that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So um, moving on to um, back to the website, Tom. Um, so then Tom, uh, we were talking about uh, the having somebody uh, on site who manages the issues related to the service provider. Um, well, if there's an outage or anything, but you will deal directly with the service provider. And I have to say, for the most part, you know, I, I have to be honest and also uh, think about the carriers that are interested in this. 
most of the libraries this last year were very happy with the conversations that they had with the local provider. And maybe you already have an excellent uh, an excellent uh, relationship with a local provider. Of course, this is a bidding process, and so it's possible that your provider may change. We also have had a couple of instances of that, depending on if they move to Fiverr or not. Um, and it's a, a local responsibility. So we go back to the infographic we introduced in the beginning of the workshop. And there are places where you as the library director will be engaged to, uh, to get some things done. And one thing I will say is the library commission, um, we've dedicated resources to, to help you with this. Um, Krista has for a long time been uh, in, engaged with uh, and uh, as the E-rate coordinator for the state for libraries and with the beauty of remote sessions, she's really gotten top notch at working with libraries if they have a question, et cetera, related to, to what they need to do. So Holly, something you said just brought up a good uh, question, I believe. Every library that's thinking about this program needs to know um, the terms of their current agreement. Mm -hmm. So if you're getting internet and being billed month to month, whether you filed E-rate on it or not, you need to know when the termination date would be on that agreement. And it's possible that you could be in a multi-year agreement that would uh, transcend July 1, 2022. And you don't want to be in a position where you have to pay a penalty to get out of one agreement and into another. If you keep the same provider, sometimes they'll allow you out of, of one agreement and into the new agreement if the value is higher. But if you're changing providers, uh, the one that has you now is not likely to let you go. Well, we've had a couple of libraries. In fact, I think there's several that are on today that had that situation last year. Yeah. So they're they're coming up and they're available. So to just one. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So. Um, uh, so again, any kinds of disruptions, they're basically you're managing it at the at a local uh, at a local level and then of course there's SIPA and if you're working through this this uh, method you will uh, have to uh, uh, enforce SIPA at your local library and um, there's no if ands or buts about that and I'm not sure um, where those resources are Krista do we have any resources related to SIPA that are available uh, yes Yep, right on our E-Rate webpage, there is a section all about SIPA. There's some information there from USAC and the FCC and ALA all about how that um, would work. Um, I do it, uh, um, go into it in my basic E-Rate training as well to talk about it so that you know, understand um, the what it, what it entails and what you do need to do. Um, okay. And I'm always here to ask questions too as well. <laughs> So I would recommend that you go out to our website and take a look at that, at, at least initially, because we're not covering that in, in this, this workshop, and and it is key and important um, to understanding, you know, uh, uh, if you're willing to do that and to take advantage of the special construction and e-rate costs. So next slide. So the next steps in your timeline. So we, I think we can go through this relatively quickly. Um, so you're going to be deciding about increments and, and bandwidth. Remember we talked about before, in order to be able to be funded through the grant for the NUSF, you have to have a minimum of 100 megabits per second. And in general, um, I think part of the, the RFP, I believe we asked for increments of 100 up to 500. So when you get your response from those that are bidding, you'll see that they've given you pricing at each one of those levels. Um, before the narrative, the RFP document, we've talked about that as far as you locally managing that, we do have an RFP that we'll make available to you to use. Uh, we'll again talk about the part that you play with that um, as far as the library director tomorrow and some more extent. Um, Thursday. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. Yeah, but last year was a day after, but thank you, Krista. So, and then also for the Form 470, this is kind of a ballpark kind of a, a date for you, but in general, this again is part of what we talk about, the importance of uh, keeping track of your dates. We will be helping you with that, of course, 
to you know, remind you that we need to see things happening and what they need to get done. And uh, the, this award and the sign of the contract is also kind of a, a fuzzy date out there, but again, that's, these dates are important. There are deadlines, but we don't know them necessarily except on an annual basis when they, the uh, USAC actually lets us know what they are. That's it. Nothing different on the right side. Those are ballparks. Uh, September 15th would be ideal to get the RFP on the street. Uh, but sometimes we're at the mercy of State Purchasing Bureau and uh, they have other projects that they're working on. So as an agency, they know, let them know how important E-rate is and the services that we're seeking through schools and libraries. So we usually are on the path. And we'll move forward. Yeah, and as far as these these deadlines, as they said, these are not these are not the deadlines in stone or anything. If this is the reason for these is to um, make sure that you have to have your four seventy done, and you have to have your contracts signed before you can apply for the funding from the Public Service Commission. So you do need to get these things done in some cases a little earlier than you might have thought of doing e rate e rate in general because there's that extra step that still has to happen. Right, and the infographic, uh, at least if you, uh, would be send that to you, if you just pack it in your office somewhere, kind of, it goes through that, so you, you know that you need to get certain things done. So, oh, did I, did I miss something? Oh, okay. So the next thing we're going to talk about is actually special construction. Um, I have to tell you, for six months when I first started working with this, I was like, special construction, what is that? But basically, it's just the word that, E-rate uses for fiber installation um, for uh, for uh, an entity, school, or library. Um, and I'm going to tell you in this section here, I did. It is pretty wordy. I'm not sure that we're, I'm not going to read all of this information. I looked at this as a possibility of when you need to go to your uh, local folks and talk about what it is that uh, you're proposing. Um, some of this you would just be able to kind of copy and paste or you would be able to read through at your leisure and be able to uh, hopefully grasp and understand what it is that you need to be telling people before you go fishing. Yeah, and we should say this, we're only in the second year of this four-year program and providers, uh, this is an alien process for them. Mm -hmm. um, they're under the impression that schools and libraries do not have any money, which is <laughs> true, at least upfront money. So their their normal process with bidding services with large bandwidth is to spread that over as long a period of time as it can to put that service in the ground. Therefore, you would never see an upfront cost. It would all just be monthly recurring. And they go, they can budget for that. They can apply you rate. So that would be better for them. In this process, we're requiring them to identify what the cost would be of constructing the fiber into the library and separating out those costs. And many of them have never done that before, but it's it's a requirement of the matching fund, the Public Service Commission and FCC. So we had some unsuccessful ones last year because they just said this is what the internet's going to cost you and they didn't bother to right. you know partition the cost we must have them do that in order for you to qualify for the extra discount right so uh basically uh special construction charges again it's talking about the eligibility support consists of these three components and again this is um, when we're talking about this this isn't something you have to come up with um, it will be guided by your RFP that you're working with with the, um, with the bidding process. So the type of service that we're looking for is there are four qual uh, three qualifying types of fiber service that are, um, I should say, installation that you can request. And we're looking at the least lit fiber that's indicated in the RFP, as well as I. Um, uh, Chris, does it actually ask you to check a box on your um, Form 470 or Form 471? Yeah. 
yeah. 470, yeah. you get the RFP with your 470 and it, yeah, it does have you say yeah. you're going to be doing that, yes. So when you're, if, if you happen to have a conversation with your provider prior to uh, moving forward in any of this sort of conversation, again, remember it is these slit fiber that you're working with. And so the next, and, and so the, this would be your other options as far as um, the other items that were on that page, which is for your information. So with the special construction leaflet fiber, the costs that are eligible are your monthly recurring costs, which we've just talked about and Tom was talking about um, how to be able to um, benefit with that. The special construction charges, which would be the actual fiber, what they're going to charge for you to install the fiber. And it is interesting um, for myself, I had a library who really wanted to know what, you know, are we talking 50,000, 100,000? I mean, there, you just, you don't know. And I would encourage you, even if you have heard from your local uh, tech person, you've asked them, most of you may have already said, hey, what would it cost for my library to have fiber? I, I wouldn't go by what they've said. What I love about this whole process is you're actually going to be having data, real real information when you file for a special construction category one um, 470 because you're going to get bids back and that will be the truth. And again, there's variability with this because of the uh, fact that the, who the carrier is. Some carriers seem to be a little more expensive than others. There's um, we, what I found too was don't assume anything. Don't assume that these are the only people who can come into your, uh, or, or who will bid on this project, the only carriers, because this is who is in my community. There's a lot of interest uh, with other uh, carriers now, and with, especially with the funding that's coming from federal government to increase their coverage. Or you may say, hey, you know, I don't have uh, there's nobody here, so they're not going to come into the library. You might be surprised because there might be an opportunity then for that particular carrier or vendor to be able to extend into the business district or maybe into residential, and they see it as a, a growth for them. I'm off topic, but here we go. Special <laughs> construction. <laughs> and I'll just throw in, if you really want to know, um, in the industry, if they're putting fiber down where none exists, and it may be at your door, and you wouldn't even know it. So there can be a vault nearby where a company has terminated their fiber on the way to the school, for example, and that may be as close as it is. But the construction costs average five to ten dollars per linear foot. So if they were trenching an entire mile to get to your library, it could be twenty-five thousand dollars. Half mile, twelve thousand. It may be at your doorstep in the front curb at a nearby pedestal, you really don't know, but we require the vendor to itemize those charges honestly as part of the procurement process. Then you will find out how much it costs. Right. Okay. So again, the, so here are the monthly recurring costs, uh, special construction charges, basic installation charges, and your network equipment. And with the network equipment, I just want to mention We'll talk about this tomorrow too. Um, often, what I've discovered is libraries that are interested in fiber, they may be excited in, to get the fiber to the library, but inside the library, they are not equipped um, with um, equip. They don't have equipment, network equipment, or wiring, etc., that is uh, capable of handling the speed and transporting that speed into the library. So it's another whole area of concern, but uh, it would be funded. You could also get your basic discount uh, for eligible types of equipment and services related to network uh, funded through E-rate also. We'll talk about it on Thursday and um, will be kind of a highlight for that, but I want to let you know that this would be something that if you have a tech support um, in your uh, library or somebody who you can trust that you could ask the question about, you know, what, what might I need to upgrade? I have one of the libraries from last 
year, um, the EFU tech person uh, was willing to come down and, and did an evaluation and assessment uh, for them to decide what they needed to order for category two. And uh, I'm willing to do that also. Um, I don't know if I would be considered a super, uh, <laughs> a, a, a super kind of a knowledgeable, but I do have some knowledge and I can tell you, and you probably know too, that a five, six year old router um, uh, is not, or if you are a BTOP library, your BTOP library routers or those types of devices will not work with the uh, new uh, fiber coming into your building. So something to think about too. All right. And so the special construction costs, we talked about it earlier, you know, the construction and network uh, facilities, it's all the, the actual labor, the, the cost to get the, the various parts and pieces and that, uh, that are needed to, from the end node to your library. And I guess I forgot to mention, Tom was just talking about how close is the, the end node for the fiber. Is it uh, North Bend was the library that um, they had, uh, it's interesting, she was going to participate, the library director had called and was interested in participating in this uh, particular program. And then she thought, well, you know, I think I saw them end the fiber, you know, put the end the fiber right in my parking lot. And so she called up the provider and they said, because she had gotten a quote earlier, um, uh, six months earlier, and it was pretty high. And uh, she said, well, why, am I, why would I have to pay that kind of money when it's sitting in my parking lot. And of course the providers then stepped back and said, oh, we didn't realize it was actually there. And, and they actually were able to install their fiber for free. So yeah, it does behoove you to get some idea about what is, you know, what's around you, where the fiber is. And there, I guess we could talk about it on Thursday and a little bit about the, map, sure. the mapping. So we'll talk, we add another topic to our Thursday uh, presentation that'll help you to find yourself where the fiber is. Um, design and engineering, that will be also in the RFP and the project management, you know, identifying who is um, responsible for the project and, and actually will be guaranteeing that this is what, you know, with the contract, this is what's going to happen. Um, this other part down here, frankly, I don't really know a lot about it. Tom, do you know about what modulating electronics is? Do we need to talk about mm -hmm. it today? <laughs> um, well, there there'll be some costs that a provider will incur. So they have to light the fiber, right? It becomes in dark as far as the company is concerned. And they have to light it for you in order to hand you an internet service. That is not part of special construction. That becomes part of non-recurring costs, which is the normal E-rate discount, or they'll spill that into the monthly recurring on an amortized basis. I think that's what they've been doing. Yeah, you would never see yeah. that show up. Yeah. So. Um, and then at the very end, it says excess strands for community or future use. So if a new company is coming into town or an existing company, and they're going to deliver service at the library in route to five other businesses, and they put in additional strands for those other uh, commercial businesses or whomever, might be the courthouse, um, they can only charge you for the cost of the fiber to your premise, not the other additional. And so there could be some cost allocation. So normally that's a really nominal fee. Once they open a trench or they're putting fiber across a power pole, that's where the major costs are. And those are all billable under this program. We can move forward. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say, um, in reference to what Holly was saying about um, what happened with North Bend finding out, well, the company finding out from North Bend actually starting this process, and oh wait, we do have the connection here. Um, that's what this, 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 there's no, you do this 470 with either yourself or with the state, there's no um, uh, obligation to go forward with it, but you can find out what's out there. You can get these companies to potentially, you know, respond and say, oh, we do actually have fiber community. You didn't know, but we have it and it's here. Um, and then you can decide what to do. Um, you might do it this year um, because you're ready, or you might just find out what it's going to cost and do it next year. 
this is a as we said in the beginning, it's like you got four years. Well, yesterday, yesterday, last year was the first year to use this funding. So um, you could be this year just checking it out and then getting prepared to actually go through with it next time. And, and I just have to mention, I didn't come up with place going fishing. It was Tom, and, so, <laughs> and I just have to disclose that. But I have to tell you, remember that because I have at least two library directors who went before their board. And the, the phrase they used, because this was the 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 board was a bunch of um, you know middle aged older men who go fishing, so they kind of knew it. You know, this is the some phrase. Something they can relate to, yes. <laughs> and again, so there is no obligation, like as Thomas said, there, at this point when you're you know you're filing a 470, there is no obligation. Um, to get out there and find out what's out there and really encourage uh, the libraries to do that. And one thing to also state is sometimes I know library uh, directors and the library is just busy and it's something that might be uncomfortable and easy for you to put off doing. But the best thing you can do is try to start right away here working toward uh, you know visiting with the, your administration can can we move forward with this again talking to them and making sure they understand there's no obligation and you actually get your 470 form out there for uh, to be seen because that gives you time uh, you don't just have to have a minimum of 28 days but when you start to get backed up toward the end of this process as you look at that infographic, uh, your your time constraint is there, and, and no library stopped doing it because they couldn't. But you have plenty of time now, and that's why we're doing the workshop now too. <coughs> I'll just jump in. Uh, at the end of Thursday, you're going to have five or six hours of content <laughs> and challenge, and then you've got to go before the village or community board and go. I'm thinking about Dr. Tom. That can be a bit of a load, and the anxiety level in municipalities where they may not be familiar with what you're talking about automatically raises. I grew up in a small town in Nebraska. If you want to set up a call with me or a Zoom call or whatever and talk any of your city administrators or village board through this process, um, I'd be happy to do that anytime. Work hours after hours, it doesn't matter. The objective is we get the fastest telecom vendor library to benefit the entire community, and we don't want anybody putting up barriers for you. So if we can help with that. Uh, please let me know or ask. And just one, just one more anecdotal story. One of the library directors went in and used the gone fishing and went sat around the table, and it was um, mostly you know the there was the administrator, but everybody else was male, and they just said. Well, you just go ahead and go fishing. Well, they're getting fiber to their library, and it's you know very cost effective. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's it's kind of a I even think using that phrase if you're willing to do it is a good one. It kind of relaxes the group. So but did, thank you, Tom. I did go to a city council meeting, but it was for the earlier green for uh, uh, Okay. And then, you know, well, we do have a question um, that I think we can clarify quickly. Um, Tani wants to know and. Would you file the 470 both ways from Network Nebraska and on your own? Yes. Yes. yes that's the idea. Yeah, you could do both, and do that, that. which is the best for you. Right. Yep. Yeah. And they'll be in parallel. So providers, we're going to double their workload actually, and on occasion confuse them that it's all we can work that out. They'll be providing in if you file in both cases. The library will actually get quotes from the state and also locally. So no problem. And then you'll be able to make a comparison. Yep. yep. Okay. So we're gonna have to roll through it pretty quickly here because I'm thinking timelines, you're you're we may have to divide your out quick then. Um, but if, I think what I would say for these next slides, in all honesty, I think they're they're self-explanatory. Uh, they're here primarily just for you to have a way of finding out information that you can, uh, as you go to a, a board meeting or something, talk about, well, what is this? You know, wh where are these funds coming from? This is uh, this is talking about the state matching funds that the FCC offers. So again, I mentioned earlier that the uh, Nebraska Public Service Commission says they'll give up to 10% 
of a match to your cost. And then the state matching funds was set up in, I think, in uh, 2014. And that they basically said, if you have state matching funds, we'll match them. So then we'll move forward to the uh, Universal Services Fund. That link there is live, and it will um, take you to uh, basically the order for the NUSF. But also at the end of it, there's a grant application, and I need to clarify whether there's any changes to the grant application. Yeah, it's just regarded as a sample. Yeah, sample. That's right. So, but anyway, that's the difficulty level that you would be um, engaged in, which was it was pretty easy to do. And then uh, the next slide um, is the basically it's the public service commission's their pu public service uh, um, announcement about this and again i find this would be something that you might be able to use to take parts and pieces of last year they did when they went to the, uh, the libraries that uh, were interested in this when they went to their boards they provided that information so we should mention that all schools are already fiber so they really can't participate here but this is for schools and libraries a mm -hmm. million dollars over four years implicates 10 million dollars worth of construction right so we don't think the money is going to run out, even if all 240 libraries or 200 or 180 that don't have fiber get fiber. It's here for you. It's just a matter of going through the process. Okay. Um, this is the guideline for it, and I'm in the interest of time today, Krista. I'm going to just go ahead and just say take a look through it to see. Um, will I think it's pretty self-explanatory but it will give you an idea of you know when you need to key dates you need to be following through and we will be engaged with if you're interested in this and making sure that this happens I hope all the libraries complete their forms and then they submitted it via e email very simple to the public service fiber go live date at the bottom 2022 oh there we go I knew there would be one in there okay uh, thank you yes that's a 2022 we will fix that before we send you these slides <laughs> And I looked this over too. <laughs> oh well. And this is just if you're really uh, looking uh, to find a request for a proposal that you want to see what they look like, this is just a, a guidance one that I left it in there just to, so you could compare at least what we've done to at least one other one that uh, is part of uh, USAC's uh, website, uh, just for your information. So again, this section right here, I really think it more or less explains itself and it is at least a point where you can uh, maybe extract information to either go to research more or you can uh, use it in presentations you might be doing to your board. Mm -hmm. So Krista and um, you have a, a, a 20 minutes I think um, or mm -hmm. more. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, before I get into this, actually, um, why don't we take a quick break? Um, yeah. Everyone, we've been uh, um, it's about an hour and a half into um, the workshop today. We don't want everyone to have to sit here for the whole three hours. <laughs> yeah, I was going to so, suggest that too. I'm sorry, uh, and I didn't put it in there because I wasn't sure where we do it. But could we do a five minute? Would that be enough for everybody? Mm -hmm. That'd be fine for me. Yeah. Okay. Um, Everybody, yeah, you can take a break, hit your restroom, refresh your coffee, whatever you need, and we'll come back in um, about five minutes. What is it right now? It is, um, 10, let's say, at 10.45 Central Time. And we'll come back, and I'll start talking, showing you how to do um, Epic. You're right. All right. So we are back. You guys want to do a sound check over there just to see? Hello, hello. Oh, that's so much better. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, we did have a little microphone confusion, um, but uh, it was okay. But we're fine. We're better now. All right. So next i am going to talk to you about where you actually do the e-rate application uh the 470. um let's see right here okay 
And for those of you who have done E-rate before, I think almost everybody here has, as you mentioned earlier, have done it at some point. Only a couple of you haven't, and that's okay. Um, like I said, that's why I'm here. I can help you through that. Um, E-rate is all, all the E-rate forms are submitted online in the EPIC system, EPIC, E-P-C, <coughs> which is the acronym for the E-rate Productivity Center. This is URL to get to that um, from um, USAC, the organization that runs the E-rate program at the behest of the FCC. It is an online place, one-stop shopping, basically for anything you need to do E-rate related. So you'd go in there and submit all your forms. You can look up your different forms, check on their status, see what their process, where they are in the process. Um, Notify there's a you have your own little uh, news section in there where you get notifications about what's going on in the program in in the process for you. Uh, if you get questions from USAC regarding your application, it comes from uh, PIA, uh, which is Program Integrity Assurance is the name of the department um, that handles that. You respond to their questions in there. Um, so everything is right there um, in, in the one place. You don't have to go to different places online, worry about emails and whatnot. You have one place to get to everything. For anyone who's participated in E-Rate, uh, USAC creates an account for your organization, which would be for you guys, for your library. Um, so any, if you've done it at all, I know that many of you said you did it up through when uh, the telephone was still going away. If you've done it 2016 or later, you have an account in there and it's got some information. If you've never done an E-Rate before, or you did it before 2016, you will probably need to contact USAC and have something set up for you. And we can help you do that if that's necessary with getting an account set up. Um, I can also just look up and see if you guys do have one ahead of time before you even start doing this, just to double check and make sure. Uh, one person is identified as the account administrator. Generally, that would be you as the library director to do that. You're the one that goes in and has the authority to just submit these forms. Um, you can have additional users if you want to. Um, if there's someone else at your library who think might be better at monitoring this and keeping up with these forms, they can complete them for you as well. Um, as you can see, there's different levels of um, permissions of the different people who may you know, be part of your library's account. Um, the library's account and each individual has their own profile for, to work with that library. Um, full user, you want that for whoever's gonna be doing all these forms. You complete everything, you file all the forms, you certify, you answer all the questions. There is partial, where you can someone come in and work on a form a little bit, but somebody else has to actually submit it. Um, and then you can have a view only um, type of account where you can just see what's in there um, and not do anything. Generally, you guys working for, with this program, all of you would do full user. There is, I'm going to go through screenshots here showing you, um, today we're just going to talk, show you the basics of your account in Epic, what it looks like, um, where you can change and, and modify things. On Thursday, we'll get into actually doing the 470 form. I'll show you that. Uh, but there's a lot of training online for this. Um, this is the E-Rate website that we were mentioning before when um, Holly was talking about SIPA. And if there's any inf information about SIPA, if you go to that, our nlc.nebraska.gov slash E-Rate. Um, I've got training videos on there, workshops that I've done. I do an online, I do a workshop every year for E-Rate and it's available online and recorded for people to watch as when it's your, when you're um, ready for it. Um, Information about SIPA is on there. Lists of recipients. So you, if you're wondering when your library did do E-Rate, should be hopefully on our list correctly. Um, but E-Rate, excuse <coughs> me, USAC themselves has a lot of good training on their website as well. Short videos, um, five minutes, maybe 10 at the longest of each section of, an, of a form and of using your Epic account and everything you might need to do. So really good resources on their website that I have links to. I highly recommend watching those. Um, also to just see a live demo of um, how the forms work as well. Um, and they also have, if you like to do things in paper or have something that just reads out what it is, user guides and instructions in PDF. So like an actual piece, you know, something you can just read through what the steps are. So when you first go to that website, <clears throat> usac.org slash e-rate, this is the page you come to. And there's two buttons here to sign in. They're the same thing. They're just the same option in two different places. It doesn't matter which one you use. Um, you just choose it and you go to Epic. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
the first time you when you log in you get this screen first and this talks about doing a whole forgot password um, process the first time you go in and use this new system you need to go through this process of changing your password uh, USAC has instituted what they call multi-factor authentication. That's a two-step process for logging in. You may have used this for other websites you have, <clears throat> where once you um, submit something, they send you a code on your phone that you then have to type in. Same kind of thing that they are doing now here for, for safety and security. So um, it is a multi-step process to get into your account. And if you have not done this yet, the very first time you use this new system, you're gonna to have to do this. Uh, so if you did E-Rate in, um, if you've already been going through this and you've been getting, and we'll see in a second here, these verification codes, you've already done this. You only do this stuff here with resetting your password once, the very first time. You do not have to reset your password every time you log in. This screen confuses people, it confused me. <clears throat> it appears that you have to that is not true you only have to um, do this once and then you just ignore all this if you did it the first time and just hit continue instead but the first time you do it you go uh, so after you've done that once you then go in and you have a username and you have a password your little forgot password link is here if you do need to do that for the first time but once you have done that you type in your username the password you have selected you make up your own password click the box to accept their uh, basic rules here <clears throat> and then sign in and then you're gonna get this uh, page that says email authentication this is that multi-factor authentication I was talking about <clears throat> the second step excuse me throw is dry <clears throat> excuse me so um you hit the button to send the email and it sends an email to your uh, whatever email address you use for E-Rate. And now it will say, enter this passcode. So you'll then have to go into your email account, whatever email you're using with E-Rate. And you have this is kind of email will have been sent to you. The subject will be one time verification code and there'll be a six digit code. This is only valid for 10 minutes, as you see it says here. So you only use it once and then delete this email. The next time you log into your E-Rate account, you're going to do this again, you get a new code, and you get a new code every time. So this time we'll grab this code, enter it into the passcode. I'm going to go back to our account, verify, and you're logged in. When you first get logged in, there are two options here of where you can go to submit different forms depending on which program you want to do. We're going to go into the E-Rate Productivity Center. The Emergency Connectivity Fund is a different fund of money, a uh, whole different concept. We can talk about that another time <laughs> but what you're going to do for this is the e-rate productivity center this gray box here is clickable you just click on it <coughs> excuse me sorry um so then you get to your applicant landing page and um don't worry about trying to read this whole screen uh, you'll have this as your slides i just want to show you this is everything that's on your main page when you first get into here so i'm going to highlight here in the middle and i'm going to zoom in is under my entities your entity number this is your build entity number this is something that usac will ask of you service providers may ask of you when pia reviewers talk to you um, this is a code number assigned to your library so um like a social security number but for the library it goes along with the life of the library um the whole time no matter who the people are working with the library that is your build entity number and that's where you can find that there also down here at the very bottom of the page, this is where you can look up any of your forms. Um, if you're wondering if you submitted a form, if you wonder where it is in the process, this is where you can search. So I get emails a lot saying, I don't know if I did this form, where am I at in the process? Did I actually do what I needed to do? You can look this up yourself, just go right there. Choose whichever form you're looking for. Choose the funding year, and then you'll get your results come up right underneath. frog in my throat of course if it is certified it means done and submitted and you're and it's all been done incomplete or nothing comes up you have not finished it or you need to actually do the form the, this is your news feed where um, at the top here in the blue bar you can um, 
you get notifications from USAC about any reforms and what's been going on with them. Excuse me. And then back to your landing page, right here is where you can make any changes and look at what's going on in your account. Um, you got here where you can submit to uh, apply for any of your form to any of your forms. Um, this news feed here, when you click on it in the blue bar at the top, um, if you notice, this has got uh, lots of different libraries and schools mentioned. This is a full news feed for everybody who is participating in E-Rate. If you want just your own library's news feed, you click on your library's name here where it says welcome. Click on news over here, and this is all information about your library. And then these are just the notifications for you for your library. So this is where I recommend you go to, not to that main one at the top that's always you know, right there. You won't find, you'll have to dig for yours. Go here to find all of your notifications. Also at the top is a task section. You're gonna to wanna to pay attention to that. This is whenever you're in the middle of working on something, they're gonna keep reminding you of it. Um, you've got forms here that I've started, um, emails, notifications about things. Whenever you see a little number there, check and see what kind of tasks you may have available. <clears throat> you can um, work on your profile here if you um, want to update or change any information. If you're a new library director, your library may have an ERA account, but it has the previous director's name. You may want to change that here. So you, if you hover over this little silhouette, you get this pop-up and you can click on profile. And you see there's buttons here to do things, but it has this big red notification that says, don't use these buttons <laughs> that are right here. Use the manage Epic user profile button up at the top. And you can see here, all of these different fields are editable. First name, last name, phone number, address. The email address is not changeable. That is your login. But if you have a generic email for the library, that's fine. You just keep using it and change the name to you as the new director. If you need to, you can set up a second account. And then if you're ever going to if you have a different email address now and, and have that be the, the one that is used. You can also update information about your library itself. That's the manage organization. You would just choose your library here click on manage organization, and then this is a huge, I just want to show you the whole screen, so don't panic here, we will zoom in. This is where you can change. If your library has moved, has a new address, um, change the name potentially. If you, you know, I, just, I know we have some libraries that have changed their names because of um, donations. You can change all that information. Scroll down a little bit. We have your urban or rural status, where you are located. That's default, comes from the Census Bureau. Any other contact information you want to put in here, you can put that in here. Uh, next section down is what kind of library you are. Um, you can put that, you can change that if you need to add anything. Something important over here, whoops, go back. Square footage. This has to do with um, how many square feet are in your library has to do with what we call category two funding, which we will talk about later, um, I think on Thursday, which is, uh, getting equipment and things for your library. They need to know how big your library is to know how much funding is available to you. Do you wanna make sure that you get this number correctly entered as how, what is the square feet of your library building? Um, this is also where you can uh, set up who your school district is that you are associated with. The, your E-rate discount is based on the school district that your library geographically sits in. So you have to make sure that this is correct as well. Um, if there's no school district here, you can run a little search, search and find your library. Ah, there it is, okay. Um, and, all right, that is actually uh, all of my slides for the basics of the EPIC system. Um, does anybody have any questions or anything you want to ask about it or anything you want, um, Tom or Holly, that you guys wanted me to cover? I think it was a, a good coverage and I appreciate um, your speedy uh, walkthrough. <laughs> it was great. Hi, to be. I think we are. We don't hear from anybody else we can move on to our uh, presenter yep and Cheryl is here I'm gonna unmute 
All right, Cheryl, I see you're here. I have unmuted you. You can unmute yourself and um, actually let me do. So just for everybody else to, to know, um, Cheryl Green is the director for the Clay Center Public Library and was one of the uh, special construction um, participation for fiber uh, to her library last year. And she has agreed to come on board and give a brief presentation and then uh, have chat time with you all. Um, you can, I guess, uh, either use the chat box or if you want to be unmuted, she can bring you in. And this is just her information in case and a little bit about what uh, the decision that was made um, that you can visit with her um, if she agrees. <laughs> I think she will. She's a lovely lady. So uh, anyway, thank you, Cheryl, for joining us. Yes, I'm happy to be here. Good morning. Morning. Um, do you want to do your webcam? You can't. You should be. You have. I just bumped you over. You should have that ability to do that now. Okay. It should be a webcam section. There you are. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um. First of all, I'd just like to encourage each of you library directors to just keep going, doing the best you can to keep up with the the date of uh, our society, things keep moving and progressing, especially with technology. So do the best you can. Holly and Krista are wonderful to help you with all the paperwork. They they saved me many times because I didn't know what some of these questions meant. And they just hop right in there and help you. And so it's not really that hard. It takes time and effort like anything does, but um, I'd encourage you to do what you can for your community. It really does make a difference when you, how fast your internet is. I had people come in from all other towns and they say, I can't believe what how fast your internet is here. And it, it's really, it really is a good thing. Um, I really don't know what to tell you. We didn't have terrible internet service before we got fiber. It was around 50 meg, not terrible compared to what some libraries are, but, um, as I said, I'm always looking for doing better. And Holly came to talk to me the year before we applied for fiber and said, these are some things you can do to get your library ready for fiber. So we did that through category two, updated some things, not a lot of things because we really try to keep our computers and technology up to date as much as we can afford. And our community is very supportive. Um, so, Holly helped push that along. And then when the fiber opportunity came along, we said, yes, of course. We found out on the late side that we could do something, but we pursued it. And with, again, with the help of these ladies, it wasn't a big deal. We've, we've got fiber and people are happy and I'm happy and it's great. So I guess, I don't know, any questions you have? Any, Holly, is there anything else I should be saying? I don't know. Well, I'm thrilled that you didn't settle for the 100 megabits. Uh and that you went to 500 and you said, my gosh, if the price is right, I'm going to do it. And, and yes. that, that was quite, a, that's wonderful. I really think that uh, you may not use it to begin with, but you certainly can grow into it. And of course it is yeah. scalable. I mean, anybody who starts at hundred can move up, you know, with those incrementals that they have in their RFP, but, but I, I like that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, and fiber is so much more, um, steady i guess i can't find the word but it's it's Reliable. it's yeah it doesn't fail as much as the other mm -hmm. wi-fi and things so this is just a better system for anybody that can can hop on the train and do it now especially with the grants and the extra help and i know every small library probably doesn't have the support that we do but i would encourage you any any of you to try to do it if you can and cheryl uh this is tom rolfus here in lincoln i grew up in sutton Hi, Tom. So I'm hoping that you can create some fiber envy with the other Clay County libraries. <laughs> well, we try to do our best. We don't go for envy, but we try to encourage others to do their best. <laughs> but truthfully, I think that may that may happen. Um, um, and, I, and this is part of it here. I appreciate you um, uh, accepting the invite and being here. Do you have any plans yet? I know it's relatively new for the fiber to be on board there, but does, has it changed any of your programming yet? Or do you have some big wishes that you, that you couldn't have done before? That... We have some wishes, but um, I'm not willing at this time to talk about them because it's uh, 
it's all not under the city council is looking at some things that we might do or might not do so um yeah we have some wishes some of it's related to technology and some of it's not but again I, I any of you out there i encourage you to just keep pushing keep driving keep trying to make your library better um, more usable more available to people and that's and we live at, this is a really old carnegie library it's it's a wonderful old building but we don't have candy handicapped accessible that's one of the things that you know we just would love to be able to change but the cost of it is horrendous and so you know you deal with and you you work around whatever you can do in your community in your building but do your best that's my encouragement for today i'm not a huge speaker so <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, we do have a question, um, and it's kind of just a broad question. Anna wants to know how much did this cost you? Um, and did you mean like how much was their whole project, or how much did it cost the library? Because that would be two different questions answers. <laughs> okay. First of all, our monthly bill for internet and we have phone didn't change a lot. It's just a little bit more, but not much. Not less than twenty dollars. Um, which is worth the huge in bump in speed. So that was my biggest thing. Can we afford this in our budget? We checked that out first. Um, the grants, we have 80% on our E-rate, which was kind of a hard thing. Holly and I worked through this. Um, last year it was 90%, but because of how COVID has affected the schools and stuff, they were passing out free food to everybody. Some people did not pass, um, sign up for the food things that they had last year. So our percentage actually went down to 80%. It was 90%. Is that right, Krista? Am I quoting it wrong? Um, well, it, it shouldn't, uh, it's supposed to be just who is eligible for the food program is what the fun, the cal calculation comes from. So the the change would it could have been if there was a change in enrollment at the school Okay, um, maybe we had other. So the, 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 uh, because of who was enrolled or who was no longer enrolled, and then okay. um, comparing that to who is eligible, that's what. Um, if you have more, the more children you have eligible for the program, the higher right. your discount rate will be. So okay. for some reason in your school district, then the percentage eligible went down. Changed. Um, oh, okay. That what would have made it go from um, uh, the 90 to the 80. Yeah. Okay. So this in, is something that also I should make clear. This is not anything the library has any control over, right? Like, Correct. Um, or is responsible for the schools. They pre they submit their data to E-rate, right? And tell them here's how many kids are on our schools and how many of them are eligible, and then that gives you your discount rate. And Correct. then the library just has to kind of follow along with that. Yeah. Well, in the in the process, we had thought we had ninety percent of this uh, special construction paid for, and then we applied for this. Um, mm -hmm. sorry, in USF grant, which mm -hmm. was 10%. So it would have been basically free to the library. So of course we were ready to do that. And then it came down that when the E-rate things came out, we had another 10% that the library had to come up with, which fortunately, our, again, our city is very supportive. And I went to them and said, this is what we're trying to do. The cost I think was around 800, I would say $850. That's not exact, but I presented it to them. Could the city afford to help us with this little 10%? And they said, yes, that's not a problem. So yeah, um, it all worked out. And I realized some communities may have more difficulty with that than we did. But uh, that's basically the co cost of the special construction were not a huge big deal to us. It was more getting through the paperwork and stuff that was <laughs> kind of mm -hmm. frustrating. But we got it, mm -hmm. thanks to you ladies. Yeah. Um, so, and did one. What was the bid total? So, how much was um, the project? If, you know, before all the discounts and stuff. She's just curious about what it did, what it was, the original cost. I don't know if you have that info, Cheryl, or if I'm not in front of, not in front of me. I'm going to talk about that. I just interrupt. I'm going to be talking about that uh, on Thursday. A little bit about, you know, just a sampling of what uh, the libraries that we had, not necessarily identifying the library itself, to give. Uh, seems to be an, of interest to the library directors to know this information, which I, I understand. But it, it was uh, pretty 
pretty wide, you know, the, the cost. And of course, that I wanted to ask you um, how far away was the node that you, your fiber, where it came from? Do you know where it, um, uh, the construction started for the fiber, Cheryl, to the library? Was it two blocks, three blocks? They actually had fiber at the courthouse, which is the next block over. So the company we chose to go with just had to bring it over basically a block. It wasn't terrible, it, you know, which it could have been more if it was way out of town or something to try to get it into town. That would have been much more expensive. Did you know they were there with fiber before you started this process? Before I started, I had checked around and I knew that there was fiber at the courthouse. I knew there was fiber at least one of the banks. And so I knew there were at least one company in town that was available. It ended up there were two. We had a kind of a small bidding war. And it all worked out. <laughs> <laughs> How exciting. <laughs> it does work in your favor, yeah. Yeah, it does. Great. <clears throat> Other questions anybody has, you can go ahead and type them into the question section, or if you want to, um, I can unmute you if you want to ask your questions that way. Um, you can use the little hand raising option if you want me to do that on the side, if anybody has any questions. I think... Holly, you had asked earlier, nobody else joined us from this morning. So the same people we had on earlier <clears throat> were the same ones that are still here. So. And I know you mentioned the forms, the paperwork. Um, there is, you know, the forms. And, I, you know, I just showed you the inter main interface for EPIC. And then on Thursday, we'll show you the actual form. Um, this is something that I can help you get through all the different steps of it as well. And I've done this kind of this, this go to webinar connection we're doing here where I'm showing my screen to you. That's how I'm showing you the slides. Um, I did this with the libraries where I have you guys show me your screen and I can see exactly what you're doing. And I just tell you, click there, click there. No, not there. The other box, that kind of thing. And um, we, I go, I did through it with many of our libraries um, this year just to make sure that we get the forms um, submitted. So uh, I would say, don't worry about all that internet. You know, do I know where to click and do I do the form correctly? um we'll get through that with you that way yeah i had a response from the libraries participating they said oh it's easy i just i just made an appointment with krista and she walked me through it and it's done. so that's great that's really uh, wonderful it is pretty quick the forms the e-rate forms the e-rate can be a um daunting uh, process yeah. to some people. Um, if you did do it years ago, which I know many of our libraries mentioned, oh, we used to, but it wasn't worth it. Or we don't do it. It was a lot of actual paper paperwork and yeah. um, so much to go through. Really has been streamlined. It's really slick now. Um, so it takes some time. Um, most of the process with this whole special construction, I think, is more not the e-rate part it's figuring out are we going to do it talking to our community talking to our mayor or whatever and then working with the providers of what is your contract that you want to send us um what does it say in it does it say the right things we wanted to say um i think the rfp is a big piece that is daunting i don't know if a uh any library would really want to go out there and, and do that and whether they would have the support of the municipality to put somebody who might be more familiar with that in the administration of the community to do that. So um, I think that's that that is, in my opinion, a must. And I know Cheryl and I we um, and Kathy walked through that on a couple of occasions. But I think in general, would you say it was relatively easy? I don't want to put words in your mouth. To fit Again, I will say you ladies made it very simple and I'm very thankful for you, both of you. You did great, wonderful to work with. Thank you. I Thank think you. the RFP can be uh, intimidating, but the template that Holly put together is great and easy. It's, it's a long document, but you just got to find the parts you need to insert your particular library's info and then you put it out there with your 470 and as as Holly said our the providers we worked with said we did you did right good so <laughs> don't have any other questions anybody typed in for you right now Cheryl but um okay. you guys probably know where to find her if you do want to ask her anything else yep I'm happy to help out whenever I can but you two are the experts and thank you so much for all you did to help us
You are welcome, and, and thank you for being here today. Appreciate yes. it. Yes. A real face. Wonderful... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> thank you. Okay. So yeah. we're just going to uh, complete with a wrap it up. This is uh, something we did last um, at the last workshop last year. We asked if you would just um, chat in the chat box, put some, uh, answer these two questions. So uh, what you found was valuable information at this training, and this would be today's training. And, and share one thing. We said just one thing <laughs> you found confusing or didn't understand at this training. If there's more than one thing, if you want to list them, that's fine. And I think we'll just kind of let you do that for a few minutes. And then um, we might, you know, just try to address some of them or, you know, just see what's going on. If not for this session, um, we can do it on Thursday, come back on Thursday and do it. Yeah, so so um, go ahead and type into your question section or, um, yeah, I'm just showing you here. And while we're waiting, I'll also mention you should have, you, you do have in the email that I sent you all today, the login link for Thursday. Um, there was the link, here's the link for Monday and here's the link for Thursday. So you should all have that and be, we should be good to go on Thursday. No problem with that one. Um, it is a different link for each day, um, so you would not use the same one you use today on Thursdays session. But we do start at the same time, right? 9 a.m. Yeah. 9 a.m. Central Time. So does anybody have any questions? Anything that was um, confusing or... Uh, I'll tell you, I can't see if you're typing, you know, sometimes with some uh, chat things you can see. I have to wait until it pops up, so... <laughs> um, all right, well, we do have uh, one here. Ann says, good to learn how affordable fiber can be brought to libraries, especially those who get comfortable, um, who get considerate E-rate discounts because of free and reduced lunch numbers. Um, yeah, most of our libraries in Nebraska, as, as I mentioned, ours range from the 60 to 70 to 80 range. Um, so it's still pretty good, even if you do have one of those lower, relatively speaking, uh, rates, um, you still get a lot covered, especially with this special, the fiber being covered with this special deal they have. Uh, Stephanie says, it's very overwhelming. Yes, we know. That's that's okay. That's why this isn't all we have for you. We're here to help you get through everything. Uh, what I learned today is that you all are fabulous. We'll hold my hand through the whole process. Thank goodness. Yes. And I, I want to mention, Cheryl mentioned that she came in, I think it was the week before, whatever all the deadlines were, is when she called and said, you know, I, I think I want to do this, uh, you know, as far as submitting the 470 and then the 471, et cetera. So, um, so she is a testament that, um, that uh, it can be done on a, a short leash, but we yeah. sure would appreciate and, uh, and uh, are happy to have you all with us today to be thinking about this um, at this point in time. Yeah. Yeah. We had those, those, you know, deadlines of when we'd like to have you start working on them, you know, next month. Um, but if you're not ready, that's okay. Um, the, the process, the, the, the big deadline is the, that really kind of, um, when we get to really to the close then is getting that, the application into the public service commission, whenever they need that in, you have to already have your 470 done and your contract and, you know, figure out who you're going to go with before you do that. So um, there has to be that, you know, time between those before. And, and I don't, like you said, Tali, you were going to check and see what, what their deadline is this year. Um, if they have something out there that's more right. specific. Because last time it was December and then they kind of fudged it to January ish, but, we like to Actually, say December. they punched it to whatever we need, <laughs> which was wonderful. <laughs> yes, they did. They were like, we were, we're that's the thing too. They're here. They just, they have this money, this million dollars to give away. It's yeah. not, it's designated, it's designated for this particular, this purpose. So they want to get it out there. Um, and I think as Tom mentioned, we're not going to go through all this money very quickly at all. We did not use very much of it the first time around. Um, so there's plenty there. Just go for it. Um, but yeah, December was when we were starting with that deadline, so we might. Uh, let's see. Um, Connie says, I'm happy to hear that we can apply and have the option to wait 
if needed. Yep, that's true. You can, and actually what you can do is you can do this for, I said 470 this year and at least get the numbers. And if you're not ready this year to com commit to everything, come back and do it again next year. That's okay. There's no, you can still do it again. And then maybe next year is when you're ready. Um, but if you're ready to do it this year, we'd love to have you. Um, will the PowerPoint be available? Yes, the PowerPoint and the recording of this will be available. We're hoping by the end of the day today. Um, as long as you know, GoToWebinar cooperates with their processing of the recording that we're doing right now, um, Holly will send an email out to you once I have it done and processed with the link to the recording and the slides from today. Yeah. Um, and Peggy wants to know, is there anything we can look into now to help us prepare to apply? What should they be doing now? Because you can email Tom. <laughs> <laughs> at least for the Network Nebraska uh, procurement. Um, I, you know, I think uh, right now if it uh, would be, uh, you might go back when we get this uh, PowerPoint and look at some of the links and read a little bit more about NUSF funding or things along that line. But I, I think it's a pretty straightforward process or schmooze your uh, city administrators, uh, you know, I don't, I don't mean to say it like that, but but basically make them aware. I think that is one thing. That's a, actually a good question in that regard. Make them aware of your intentions and maybe feed them small amounts of information as much as they want to know. Um, be sure to let them to begin to understand what you're talking about doing. Because I think if you, like today for the workshop, if you showed up and you were, um, you know, presenting all that information, it would be hard for them to absorb. But mm -hmm. I'd be happy to help you. Uh, last year, I put together for several of the uh, board meetings kind of a presentation. Um, in particular, if you move forward with a 470 um, and you want to present to the administrators of the, the city or board, whomever needs to know kind of a, a breakdown of cost, um, mm -hmm. I can do that too. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, uh, someone wanted to ask, someone was asking when you mentioned about contacting Tom, what his email was. So that's why I just popped it over here so okay. you can see. Um, yep. Here is our contact information for the three of us, if you do have any questions. And I, the as far as uh, Thursday, uh, main topics will be the RFP, um, the category two, which is the funding that exists in E-rate for uh, network eligible equipment, which um, Cheryl brought up how the year before uh, she applied this last year for fiber, we had gone through to determine an assessment what was needed. And uh, she applied for category two funding to help pay for that. So in her case, whatever her percentage with the free and reduced the school lunches that was what she got discounted off um i think now it's different and and we'll have maybe krista will be able to explain a little bit more about how they're doing uh category two funding from this year forward yeah. uh we have another question here um which is uh here um, we have plenty of time if any other questions go ahead and type them in we're not wrapping up you know we actually are ahead of time schedule right schedule here, here. <laughs> Totally. So any questions you want to ask right now, go ahead. Um, but Randy wants to know, it seems like you have to go partially through the process before you can determine the final cost. At what point are you committed? Um, that's true. E-rate in general is um, you, you're asking for the 470 for um, companies to provide a service with you and to tell you what it would cost. Um, and then you do get if you do pick, then you pick one of them and you sign a contract with that company. Um, so once you get the bids from these companies, that's when you'll know what it's going to cost from them. And then, you know, we do the math of, okay, the um, Public Service Commission covers 10% more and then the E-rate matches 10%, then you'll know what your final costs could potentially be. Um, but as far as being committed, we are putting into the, con when we do it directly from us, now Tom, maybe a different process for you, um, we're having put into the contracts, and we did this last, this the year that we're currently just working on, uh, a clause that states, this contract is only valid, we only go through with this um, construction if E-rate is approved. Because that's the thing, your E-rate application has to be approved still. 
Um, the 470 is saying you want to apply. Um, the, the, then there's a second form saying we've picked our service provider. You tell E-Rate you've picked your service provider and you've been approved for this Public Service Commission funding to help with it. And then you wait to see if you're going to be approved for the E-Rate funding. Um, so E-Rate is not a, an, I'm going to say this officially, it's not a guarantee. There's always a chance they could deny. However, this has not happened to any of our applications for this yet, so <laughs> um, they want to push special construction, um, and we're here to help sure you make you make sure you do it. So you will sign a contract, but there will be a clause that says this will not happen though unless E rates approved. So you've got kind of that um, the buffer it's, it's, safety net it's, safety it's, net. Yeah, contingency. Yes, contingency, yes. So you'll sign off on something, but don't panic until your rate's approved and you know that you have all that covered, the 80% plus the extra 20% or whatever your e rate discount is, then it's actual committed that it's actually the project's going through, going forward. Yeah, very good, Krista. And our state process is very similar, only that we bind the company to the pricing that they had offered in a state master contract and then no work goes forward until an actual work order is submitted, which means you tell the company, yes, we're ready, uh, we've got E-rate, we're gonna go ahead and, and light the candle, so to speak. And sometimes we have July 1, 2022 as a target date. Your fiber can come up even later than that. And you yes. might wanna go into that, Krista. That's the thing too to be aware of. Yes, um, and that on that timeline, the schedule that was in the very very beginning of all the dates. Um, yes, the E-rate funding year starts always on July 1st of any year, and normally it, that is when your service can start. However, it could be later depending on when things get approved. I know right now, and I still have to check. We still have we still have some libraries who applied for E-rate for this current funding year, 2021, and we're in August. Who have not been approved yet. It doesn't mean they're being denied, it's just there are so many applications that come into E-Rate, it can take them some time to approve them all um, and get through them all. Um, no matter when you're approved, you will get your E-Rate discount going back to July 1st. So if even though somebody doesn't get approved till this month, their monthly costs for July will be covered, will be discounted, they'll just be some sort of credit on a future bill or something. Um, but it can take some some time for that to happen. Ideally, it gets done in the spring. Everything's done quickly. You get your approval, your construction gets done, and your fiber starts July 1st because everything went nice and quickly. And with the six, seven libraries we had, for some of them that happened, and for some of them it's still in the process. It's, yeah. So we've got these dates, but... Uh, it may be a little later than July 1st of 2022 when you'd actually get your, have your fiber working, depending on how it all goes. And most of it is unfortunately waiting for E-rate, waiting for USAC to do their part. I would just mention one other thing. I, I was out for to run an errand, but um, one thing that happened with all these little, um, uh, the computer with chips that aren't available, with the category two um, uh, utilization for ordering equipment, I mean, ordering any kind of equipment, but if uh, you're thinking about working with E-Rate 2 to do this, um, I know that some of the libraries for this last uh, fiber build also purchased some equipment and they're waiting up until November for some of the equipment to come in. So not even e I agree with you about E-rate, and, and uh, <laughs> but I also think, you know, just the world situation currently. True. So there, one, one there's thing other that, circumstances that may delay things that nobody has any, none of us have any control over yet. Right. And I would encourage, you know, potentially um, that you could consider doing an assessment of your uh, network equipment. And if you're really not ready for fiber quite yet, you probably may need to do some type of upgrades anyway with your uh, uh, network equipment and have an assessment done and you could even work on that this next year and then the following year do fiber or do them both at the same time. But I, I have to say to a certain extent, that's a bit o overwhelming to mm -hmm. get done. And all, all at once, yeah. Because your fiber can be ready, but you don't have your the equipment to run it yet. 
So yeah, no matter how good the connection is and the speed is coming into your building, if you don't have the actual physical equipment that can handle that speed, it doesn't matter. It's not gonna, if you have an older router or older cabling, it just can't handle the faster speed. You're not gonna get that speed ending up at the computer end. So you need to in replace the equipment in addition to the speed that's coming in. Um, you could do an E-rate application this year just for the equipment, get that all done. And then next year to have the fiber run, you know, plan that ahead. But you can do it all at once too. We've got libraries that have done um, both. They, they've got their fiber, their special construction, and they apply for the equipment. Now, when that equipment comes in, yeah. <laughs> um, and then Randy, does, Randy does have another question. And yes, uh, the cost. Uh, the question is costs are two parts, initial and ongoing. Yes, there's the initial construction, the actual special construction of getting the connection to your library. And then there is the monthly um, cost to keep that um, service going. And the special construction is what gets that extra public service commission funding. Um, your regular monthly E-rate cost for just continuing it month to month is just would just be your regular um, E-rate discount, your standard 60, 70, 80, whatever it is off of that. And you apply for both of those at the same time. We would apply for the special construction to be done and then to continue with the monthly discounts as well. And Peggy says, our city seems to be on board already. Nice. Well, mm -hmm. congratulations. <laughs> so I think some of our homework for our team before Thursday, and Krista, you may have already done this, we can look up the uh, percentage discount for each of the oh, yeah. libraries that have expressed interest and also check on their EPIC. Uh, logins and account administrator to see if that's current. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That will be done, yeah. I'm gonna write it down. Um, and that, we got another question. Stephanie asked, 470, oh, oh, okay. Actually, no. Stephanie asked, the 470 cannot be filled up before September 18th. Actually, no, that, that, September, that September 18th was the when we wanted you to have it done by. No, you can do the 470 right now. Um, the 470 um, always goes live every year, every year when the funding year opens on July 1st. So the 470 is available right now. Um, that September deadlines that we were talking, those are actually the deadlines of when we would want them to put, hopefully have you have them done by so that then you can get approved, get the, the bids in, then apply for the Public Service Commission money before the end of the year. So we're trying to get things done as well, the quick. Stephanie, can you wait until um, after Thursday? Because we'll want to make sure we have the RFP uh, out there also uh, to accompany yeah. the 470. So. Yeah, yeah, you okay. So yeah, I should I should back up. that yeah? So actually, to answer your question, her question was it can't cannot be filled out before September 18th. The answer to your right. question is no. You can do it now, but for this special construction, you're going to need the RFP that right. has to go with your 470. So you're going to don't you can't do a 470 until um, on Thursday. We're going to show you the the template of that and how that all works, um, and then you can work with Holly on customizing your RFP to whatever it needs to be for your library. And then submit it with the 470 at the same time. Yes, yeah. yeah, so you're going to need that RFP done ready first to attach to your form. Ah, she's just wanting to get it straight in her head of when to do things. Yep. Um, yeah, it is a lot and a lot of timelines. So basically the first thing is get, you know, think about it, talk about it, get the RFP ready. And then when you have the RFP, then you can do the 470. All right. Any other questions? Anything else, Holly and Tom? Oh, wait, of course, something pops up. Uh, 
Oh, okay. Uh, Stephanie says you mentioned uh, about the city getting city approval that the money goes through them. How does that work if the library is owned by the township and not the city? Um, it'll go. It goes. It doesn't matter. It's whoever you whoever handles the funding is where the money will go to. It's um, whoever you officially are, as you said, owned by. Um, that's who it would work with. Right. Um, if all of your funding has to go through the township, that's what you, who we rate will work with. If it goes directly to the library, we would work directly with the library. Yeah. So pretty much you tell them. <laughs> so wait to see if anybody has any other questions. Um, oh gosh, I don't know the answer to this question. Uh, you might know, Tom. How do you find out where the nearest fiber node is? <clears throat> well, it's for reasons of national defense. The company will probably not tell you. <laughs> but sure. if you do have an existing provider, and particularly in communities or villages where you know them to be the only one, uh, go ahead and call their 800 number and ask for engineering. Or if you have an account representative, they may be able to tell you. Um, it's not a requirement or necessity for us to know. We really don't know what their infrastructure is like until we start to see the bid responses come back. Because they're going to bid the marginal cost from like their central office to your front door or to the nearest closest handhold of fiber to your front door or whatever. So we oftentimes don't even know. And because we're bidding a service, they don't have to tell us any more than what they put into their detail on the RFP response. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they may suppress detail and then uh, PIA, as Chris mentioned, will come back and ask questions while they're reviewing the application uh, for funding. And then the company must uh, cooperatively respond. Mm -hmm. So they'll tell yes. you as much as they can in the bid response, and then sometimes we have to go back for more information. That is something we learned from the first round, that um, something very specific that the second form of the E-rate process for was how many feet or whatever from, how many feet of construction is being done, like from where it's starting to getting to the library. And some of our companies did tell us that, and some didn't, I discovered. Uh, we'll have to ask. Um, but when I worked with some libraries on their forums, it was very easy, actually. The companies, they do know. They have to know. They don't always, like since I put it out there. Um, I worked with at least two libraries um, who, while I was doing the go the, the 471, the form with them and a go to webinar, looking at their screen, and I said, well, okay, where, well, what's that? Where's that amount? You know, we need those details and they looked and said they didn't put it in here and they just turned around, well i'm just going to call bob at the company and so they called got an answer i stayed on the line with them and then we filled it in and kept going so they will get that information to you when you need to ask when you need it yeah and one other point um, if you're in a community where all of the electrical and telephone is underground like half of lincoln um, there's probably conduit in the ground that could be carrying fiber. If you're in a muni municipality where everything is above ground, where it's riding a telephone pole or a power pole, um, you're beginning to start looking up, right? This will be part of your homework. The normal lines you see that are carrying either telephone or power are running across insulators. And if you look at the very top of the T, uh, there may be a single line of coax all by itself. That can actually be fiber writing that same uh, pathway of telephone poles. So mm -hmm. start looking. It may not be long no. to the company 
that will do business with you, but you may know that there is overhead infrastructure there. And when we bid fiber, uh, the company will bring it to your library, either uh, underground, which is terrestrial, or aerial, which is above ground, and they get to choose. Um, but we hold them accountable for reliability. So if they choose overhead, which is cheaper, uh, you may not have any squirrels <laughs> in your community. Uh, you may not have ever an ice storm in your community, et cetera, et cetera, or it could contribute to an outage. And that's why a lot of companies will put fiber underground because unless you have a backhoe, you know, trenching right through, and we've always heard those horror stories, um, that fiber is normally pretty resilient. And then you worry about prairie dogs instead of squirrels. So I can tell you <laughs> stories if we have a lot of time left on Thursday, <laughs> things you don't want to know about uh, telecommunications, but uh, hope that helps with your question. Yeah, you might not know, but we'll, you will find out. Any other questions you got, you all want to ask today? We will be getting into a lot more details again on Thursday, so a lot more to hear about and learn. And we can always revisit. So yes, yes. Um, you know, yeah. Thursday we will go through what we have on our agenda for Thursday, but um, this is all connected today and Thursday. So um, if you have, you know, come up with questions that you think about think of between now you can always go back to what we talked about today and ask us questions about it of course want to make sure you have all the information you need as much as we can to help you understand this and to communicate it to your community about something that you may want to be doing I don't see anything new coming in so we might be able to wrap it up as soon as I say it someone's gonna type in some long thing I know <laughs> All right. Anything else you want to wrap up or talk about for on Thursday for Thursday, Holly or Tom? Nope, not at this point. Just want to thank everyone for this sit and get session, and they've been very attentive with excellent questions. So thank you. All right, I don't see anything new coming in. I think we will wrap it up for now. Uh, we will see you back here again on Thursday. Use that email I sent you, uh, use the Thursday link, and we will talk about on Thursday uh, RFPs and the 470 and any other things we need to know about it. And what's, what other, what other um, funding is currently available? There's so much funding out there. Oh yes, this isn't the only thing out there make it even more confusing <laughs> but that's it there's more money go for it there's going to be a way for you guys to get this done <laughs> all right well thank you so much for uh, joining us this morning yeah. all right thank you everybody and as i said we yeah you will have these slides and the recording should be by the end of the day today um I'll email it to everybody um to all of you who attended and you they don't know. The ones who weren't able to make it with us today, um, we'll send it to them as, as well, everybody who registered too. So we'll look for that. All right. Thank you. We'll see you on Thursday. Okay.